everyone. Welcome to our first episode of Homegrown Eats. And today is a holiday edition because Christmas is almost here. I am here today with Scott Brinker from Monument Health. He is the executive chef there. So Scott, tell us a little bit about yourself and also what we're gonna be cooking today. Sure, sure. Um, like I said, my name is Scott Brinker. I am the executive chef at Rapid City Monument Health. I've been there for approximately seven years. I'm from South Dakota. Uh, I went to culinary school out in uh, Mitchell, South Dakota, many, many moons ago. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, I've been cooking professionally for now for over 45 years. And what I'd like to do today is, is present and talk about some of the foods and the food philosophy that we have up at the hospital, um, some of the items that we do use, and uh, project the, the food as medicine mentality and knowing the story of your food. Uh, so not only do we, we do this for like our, our customers that come in, but for like our patients also. Uh, it's very important for them to eat healthy and uh, eat the right amounts of food in order for the medicine and the care for them to work. Well, today we're going to start out by talking about the, the beef that we use at the hospital. Okay. I get this from uh, uh, Evergreen Beef. It uh, is headquartered out of uh, Custer, South Dakota. Hmm. It also has uh, pastures and raises the cattle out on Spring Creek and over by Edgemont. So just a few moments from town and you can see, see our cows. They are on all natural grass. Uh, and that's that's all they eat. There's nothing extra in this meat. It's all beef. We know the story. We can go out and we can see the pastures. We know where the beef came from, what the what the beef ate, and how it got here. We know the story of our food, and that's that's very very important. So there's nothing in this that shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. There's nothing extra. You know, we didn't add anything to this beef. It's it's you know, 100% South Dakota raised, South Dakota grown beef. What we're gonna talk or do here is this is the tenderloin. This is one of the, the choice cuts. It's very tender. Uh, this lends very well, especially to a grass finished, grass fed beef that's usually a lot leaner. And so the tender cuts of meat are, are a little better to use. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna clean this up a little bit. We're gonna cut it, then I'm gonna make a seared beef tenderloin. We'll put a crust on it while well, they have the little bit of peppercorns and a little bit of salt and pepper and herbs on it. We're gonna flash cook it and then finish it in the oven. So the first thing that I wanna do is cut this into a little bit easier pieces to work with. And we'll remove, it's called the silver skin. And what it is is basically just a tendon or ligament. Should have paid a little closer attention in, uh, in physiology class. But, uh, <laughs> That's okay. We're not doing science here. We're doing cooking. <laughs> and we're just going to trim it up to make it look a little bit nicer and cleaner to present. And using a very sharp knife is probably beneficial in this process. Yeah, a sharp knife helps. And, and kind of the, the thing is, you notice I've kind of got a, a funny looking glove on here. Now I've been doing this for a long time and I have had my share of cuts and stitches. <laughs> and then uh, one day somebody said, hey, you know what? If you wear this cut glove, that stops happening. Oh, wow. And so I put that on. And uh, since I've been wearing the cut glove, it was a little kind of cumbersome to get used to. Mm -hmm. But once I did, I stopped getting cut. So I'm sold. <laughs> I, I like that. I'm just going to put a little olive oil on this, just so things kind of hold on to it a little bit better. Rub it down. And then I have a little bit of sage. Now we're going to put a little garlic on this. Tuck a little bit in there, just a little bit. Salt and pepper. I have learned over the years that that's uh, that's the most important seasoning in the, the whole cupboard. It goes a long ways. Um, you know, one thing is that I train a lot of chefs, up and coming chefs in, uh, um, at, the, at the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of, uh, you know, my, my legacy, I think, is to make sure that these guys uh, uh, go forth and, and feel good about what they're doing. And I make them write recipes as part of their training. Hmm. And so the first thing I tell them to do is you write a recipe and you're only allowed six ingredients. Oh. And you have to, you know, you stop focusing on the fancy and start focusing more on the execution. It's more important. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do here is I've re uh, preheated the skillet. Hopefully it's hot enough. Put just a little bit of oil down. And what I want to do is sizzle this. This will make a lot of noise. It'll give a lot of smoke. It's great. And uh, uh, I'm just, I want to caramelize, get a nice color around the edge. Okay. It's going to seal up the edges. Oh, yeah. There's the sizzle. That's, that's my sound. <laughs> I like that. 
the better we get this seared, the, the juicier it'll be at the end. It doesn't really block things off too much and let the juice uh, um, uh, out. We're still gonna deal with that, but uh, this gives the, the nice color and it does lock some of it some of it in. You know, a lot of what you deal with when you're cooking grass-fed, grass-finished beef is the fact that the, the fat is distributed throughout the muscle. It's not marbled like a regular uh, piece of beef. Uh, the fat is stored within the muscle tissue itself. So though it looks really, really lean, it still has that nice fatty uh, flavor that, that we all like. What I do up at the hospital a lot of times is I don't use canola oil or uh, soybean oils. We use all olive oils or natural okay. butter. And uh, it's because natural fats are better. If 2020 hasn't taught us anything, I think one of it is to slow down. Slow down, Really absolutely. get back absolutely. to tradition and our roots and supporting people. You know, I've seen so many people wanting to shop locally this year, more yes. than ever. Um, and this is something local businesses have been screaming for years well, but <laughs> uh, same goes with our local producers we've seen a supply chain deficiency this year and oh, everyone's like wow okay food doesn't automatically and magically appear on the grocery shelves <laughs> it comes from somewhere else and they need to be supported so I think this is something of we're at home more, we're spending more time with our family, so learn to cook. This isn't that difficult. No, no, this, what we're doing here is very nice food, very simply done. Right. So that's, we, we, we done made a nice <laughs> Christmas Thanksgiving roast. It's for all practical and purposes done. Okay, now we've got a good sear on it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the pan's hot. Now this is the hardest part of the, the whole operation here, is picking up the pan without getting burned. <laughs> I love using cast iron. You know, I'm a traditionalist. Uh, cast iron holds its heat very well, and so you need to be a little bit careful when you pick it up. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it in a 350 degree oven, just like it is, pan and all and we'll let Mother Nature do its own little thing. We're gonna give it about 10 minutes in here, and then we'll take, uh, shut the oven off and just kind of let the heat carry over and slowly bring the meat back up to temperature. Okay, like with every, every good piece of meat, you know, it, it's it's a sin to put ketchup on it. It's a sin to <laughs> I put agree. <laughs> some of these other sauces Steak sauce. on it. But you know, let's give it that holiday flavor a mm -hmm. little bit. Uh, what I love to use is cranberries. Oh. I'm a cranberry nut. Cranberries are so good for but me. But fresh cranberries, right? Well, you have to use kind of a combination. So okay. I'm gonna use fresh cranberries, of course. They're a little bit different than what. Uh, um, what most people use, they're kind of hard, they're woody. I went out and picked some cranberries one time. That's So there's not a heck of a lot of juice. Oops, into the nuts it goes. But uh, <laughs> um, there's not a lot of juice into it. And there's also, it's a very, very tart flavor, which, which I really like. Um, to add to, to call something a glaze or something to really accent a, a steak, I want to make it a little bit sweet and bring out the fruity flavor okay. of cranberries. So I will also use the dried cranberries. Mm. Uh, that's just a cranberry that's basically concentrated. Okay. So uh, we're gonna start, uh, get the pan kind of a little bit hot. Um, yeah, let's add this first and see what happens. We'll start out with a few of them in case I mess something up. And we're gonna just start heating these little guys up. And I'm gonna add a little bit of water to it. And as that starts to uh, come to a boil. Does it matter how much water? No, because we're gonna cook most of it off. Oh, okay. So we're just gonna use it as a as a medium. We can use some high, high heat. Uh, it's gonna soak up into those dried berries. Okay. Uh, we're gonna break down the, uh, the structure of the, uh, the cranberries themselves. Uh, we'll add a few extra little things. I've got something here that's, that's, that's really 
really cool. I think it's kind of like a cough syrup. It's uh, some cherry liqueur. Oh. Um, in case things get get a little bit out of hand, <laughs> um, we, we can it relax and keep benefits, chugging. multiple benefits, right? Yeah, so, yeah, there again, a little bit is good, a lot is better. Uh, we'll cook the alcohol off of it, of course, so we don't have to worry about uh, grandma getting a little bit silly at the, <laughs> at the dinner table for us. Not at least with this, right? Yeah, well, right, right. <laughs> uh, a little balsamic vinegar, give right. it a, a little bit of a acid flavor to it. Now this is kind of where my old age rears its ugly head. I have fallen in love with lemons. You know, my grandpa growing up, uh, he was his, he liked lemon everything, lemon bars, lemon on everything. And I thought, you know, that's kind of strange, grandpa, but now that I'm as old as grandpa was, you I like lemons. citrus. You know. <laughs> Maybe it's genetic, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm just gonna, a little fresh citrus and a lot of things, any kind of a sauce or baking, you'll see that we'll, as we get on to, um, uh, dessert that uh, I use a lot of the uh, uh, citrus zest and citrus juices. I just uh, I like the freshness and the uh, uh, you know the that gives you that a little extra kick of flavor. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add a little bit of fresh parsley. Now, one thing that I, has always kind of haunted me. Uh, all my my cooking career is that uh, you go into a lot of kitchens and you know they, they use only certain parts and then they throw a lot away and it just makes sense that uh, um, you know as Americans you we hear you know on the news and stuff oh we throw away 60 percent of our edible food and I was like man that's a huge 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 number mm -hmm. and you know I never believed it until I started touring different kitchens and we got to uh, see how full their garbage cans get. <laughs> so, you know, it, it is true, like with, with parsley. The same flavor that's in those leaves are also in the stem. So, there's really no problem in using the stem also. Interesting. Um, you know, also with uh, a lot of the more coarse stems, uh, we use a lot of fresh basil, a lot of fresh rosemary. Now those things you can't necessarily use the, uh, the stems for, but we make our own stock. Oh, okay. The one thing that I, I do get when uh, I, I buy the beef uh, from Evergreen Ranch is I, I buy the bones also. And so we really? roast the bones and we make our own beef stock up there so we can make our own gravy. Uh, and we did it, I did it mostly because of the flavor aspect. I mean, you get some beautiful flavors. It's just amazing, especially uh, uh, from uh, fresh beef bones. If you roast them and, uh, with all your little vegetable scraps and, and I, you get some great flavor. Now the, the medicinal value of it is becoming really, really apparent. And there's holistic doctors that are prescribing it. So you could go down to the grocery store and buy pre-made beef bone stock for six, seven dollars a quart or a pint or however much that is that they, they put on there. And uh, you can make it at home. <laughs> Your butcher has bones up bones. at the butcher shop. Go buy some bones, roast them up, use your stems, use your onion skins, use your all the little pieces of celery and uh, carrots that you usually throw away. Put it in there, roast it up, cook it down in a nice simmer overnight. And uh, what you got? is a great soup base that's good for you. <laughs> the liquid in the cranberries has now come to a boil <laughs> and uh, we're gonna let it just kind of cook down. You see the, the fresh cranberries are busting open. Mm -hmm. They're soft, they're getting soft, they're taking on moisture. Uh, they're gonna pop open and release all their, their flavors. Uh, so we're gonna take that, let that kind of take down. And now one thing that I'm really adamant about is local honey. Mm -hmm. uh, I buy this right here, uh, uh, someone's in the kitchen uh, from Sunrise Hives, it's okay. a local bee, uh, bee Keeper, they've been around for a little while. They do a great, great job, and uh, um, you know the, the whole beekeeper honey thing is making a great resurgence. And it's, it's kind of cool because you learn things by by looking into some of this. Like South Dakota is the second largest producer of honey in the country, second really? only to Kentucky, and we're catching them fast. So it's it's wow, kind of that's a, neat. it is kind of an amazing thing. And like with everything else in South Dakota. We grow great beef, we grow great vegetables, and the bees love it out here. No murder hornets for our bees. We're, <laughs> thank goodness. Thank goodness. So I'm gonna put a couple tablespoons of this fresh, uh, locally produced by South Dakota honeybees, honey in there. That's impressive. 
and <laughs> that, <laughs> luckily, is that. So what we're going to do is we're going to pour this into the blender. Okay. Hope nothing crazy happens here. <laughs> I'm dripping it all over. Maybe we'll have enough for the sauce by the time I get it in there. <laughs> okay. Television cameras make me nervous. Okay, so where it's nice and hot, our berries are nice and soft. We're gonna blend it on low till it gets uh, liquefied. And voila. And just like that. And this is going to be drizzled on the meat? Right, right. Just at service time. Well, that's pretty. You talk about color, and you're right. It's just beautiful. Yes, so we get all, all those nice, colors. bright colors. You can kind of smell the balsamic coming out mm -hmm. there. You want it a little bit sweeter, just add a little bit more honey. Mm -hmm. uh, you can add a little red pepper to it. And that's, oh, that's give fine. A give it a little spice. bit of spice. Mm -hmm. And then we'll put a little uh, uh, fresh parsley in there. And I'll use my filled expedient mixer. Now we've got a nice holiday it's beautiful. red and green cranberry glaze. Mm -hmm. Just like that. And it wasn't that difficult, but it's extremely impressive. Right, right. Uh, there again, uh, simplicity at its finest. We had maybe, what, one, two, three, four, five ingredients. Five ingredients. Five ingredients. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll have a, a fresh cranberry flavor. Cranberry is very, very holiday centric. Definitely. And uh, um, it'll accent that meat very well. What it's going to look really nice on is going to look good on the plate too. Exactly. It looks good. It's going to taste good. And you can take a picture, post it on social media for all your friends oh, to see. Oh, absolutely. Look what I got. <laughs> look uh, at what I did. Uh, on you. you know, <laughs> You're going to eat that turkey. I'm going to have a piece of fresh South Dakota locally grown beef. <laughs> <laughs> right now we're going to make a roasted butternut squash. One wow. thing that grows very, very well here in um, western South Dakota is butternut squash. Uh, this, again, came from Cedar Creek Farms. Uh, squash is... It's so typical just to make uh, uh, like, you know, a candied squash. It's usually considered sweet. And now butternut squash is very sweet, but you also get a very good yield at it. It's very thick and uh, very, very, very meaty. And so I like to play on several different flavors when I make it, though. So I use the sweetness of the squash, and then I'll add a little bit of salt, uh, flavored butter of some sort, uh, maple syrup to accent the sweet, kind of give a little bit of a... Uh, more of a rustic flavor. Hmm. And then I put a little red pepper and uh, other ingredients into it and serve it instead of mashed potatoes. Makes oh. for, a, for a really uh, uh, really interesting and very, very colorful plate. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first thing that I'm gonna start with, so I'm gonna melt a little butter. A little? A little. <laughs> A little, a little butter is good, a lot of butter is better. Especially for Christmas. But especially for we Christmas. We need to indulge. Um, butter makes everything better. So I'm going to put a little bit of sage in here, and we're just going to let that start doing its thing. What I'm going to do is let that cook very slow and low until it turns brown. And that's going to really bring out a nice nutty flavor that goes very well with the squash. The first thing that uh, I need to do on the on the squash here is all I'm going to do is take the stem off, and then hopefully, without cutting my hand in half, just split the squash right down the middle. And how many people will this one squash serve, roughly? Well, as you can see, this how meaty mm -hmm. uh, this is. Now, when we roast it, it's going to lose a little bit of this moisture. Okay. But this will serve uh, four to six people. Okay. You know, depending on how hungry you are. Um, I put it just straight onto the pan. I leave the seeds in. Oh, okay. Uh, the reason why I like to leave the seeds in, because there's, you know, there again, it's got a slightly different flavor profile to it. Hmm. And as you roast the seeds, that flavor imparts into uh, the, the squash itself. So we will put this into the oven. Again, I just go with a 350. I'll save one of those little guys back. 
and uh, this is going to take about an hour. So we'll need to. We'd like a, a squash. We're going to make mashed squash. And we're going to like mashed potatoes or mashed sweet potatoes, anything you make like that. It's nice to kind of, you know, elevate a good dish to something excellent, to something great. And how you do that is with texture. So I'm going to use uh, jalapeno pepper. Okay. Again, we grow amazing jalapeno peppers in uh, uh, South Dakota. And they can get a little spicy. Now, the thing to know about the jalapeno pepper, and with most peppers, is that most of the heat lives within the little ribs and the, the white stuff inside the pepper. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is, because I don't want a lot of heat, mm -hmm. and some people can't take heat, um, is get rid of the hot part of the jalapeno okay. and just use the flavorful part. So I'm gonna go around the edge and we'll leave the hot stuff behind. And you know, just depending, you know, at, at my house, we like to eat it a little bit spicy, so I leave some of this stuff in there. But for most purposes, you get rid of anything in there that might have a lot of heat. And it, it surprises people. I do a lot of cooking classes on, on jalapeno peppers and using hot peppers. And this always surprises people about how flavorful a jalapeno is and how little heat that's actually in the meat of the pepper. <laughs> so we're just gonna do a nice little fine dice on it. Have a couple of them handy here. And again, it's a sharp knife is a happy knife and you will cut yourself much less if your knife does what you need it to do. And so we'll do probably two jalapeno peppers in this? Two jalapeno peppers. Okay. And uh, like I said, we'll put those in fresh. I don't really want to cook these at all. Now you can can cook it, mm -hmm. and it does uh, it does change the flavor profile, but I like, you know, again, we've got a nice soft squash. So, we'll so add we add a little crunch. bit of crunch to it. Yep, kind of a... A different texture just to more for a color thing and then again it, it adds a little bit of the the peppery flavor is is the red pepper a red sweet pepper again locally sourced um, at the hospital I uh, um, buy as much as I can locally uh, we buy approximately three million dollars a year worth of food oh wow um, this, this year was just a little bit strange, but on the average, I'll spend a little over $500,000 a year on local foods. <laughs> so that's, uh, um, you know, when you think about the economics of that and what that does for our community, that's $500,000 that stays here. That created jobs in Sturgis, South Dakota. That's created jobs in Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, you know, why is it important to use local foods? The, the taste aspect and the uh, freshness and the health aspect is all good things and that's what we keep on the forefront. The economic impact mm -hmm. is huge. Mm -hmm. That money stays local. And uh, um, you know, you're, you're helping out the community, you're helping out the farmer. Very little of the money that you go spend at the grocery store actually goes to the farmer. It goes more to the manufacturer, more to ad advertisement, more to driving the, the produce from wherever it comes from, mm -hmm. you know, and whatever that story is, uh, to the consumer. You might say it's, you know, can't afford to eat healthy. Well, you can't afford not to eat healthy. We've got the peppers. We're gonna, we're gonna stash these little guys over here to the side. Um, I've got my butter now. If we, if we can look at it, it's it's mm -hmm. it's browned up. We're just gonna drench it in this, this brown <laughs> butter. Wonderful. So yeah, we're gonna um, there again. Like I said, we like to use a little bit of clashing flavors. So the sweetness, we're gonna accent with just a little bit of red pepper mm -hmm. flakes. That's gonna give it just a little bit of heat. And then I'm gonna put a little bit of this this syrup in here. And you know, uh, sometimes I like to experiment live. I've never used this type of syrup before, but uh, it was, it's kind of an interesting, interesting story. It's a bourbon barrel Oh, syrup. neat. And, uh, you know, just kind of one of the issues when you go to the grocery store and you buy something like this, mm -hmm. bourbon, it pops up on the register as bourbon, and so I get somebody to come over and check my ID to buy maple syrup. So uh -huh. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> just, it's I mean, just I need to syrup. see your ID, and I'm like, why? <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> so, all right, so we've got our brown brown butter here. 
we're gonna let's set that aside and let us do its thing. We're gonna set this aside, okay. and then we can start working on, on the dessert while we wait for everything else to, Perfect. to go. move on to making a dessert now. So what we're going to make is a, a, a bread pudding and I'm going to put my own play on it. Uh, with most holidays there's a lot of tradition and uh, family recipes that get passed on from generation to generation and one of my earliest culinary uh, uh, influences was my grandmother down in uh, Texas. She was a very fine, you know, uh, traditional southern lady and everything was was cooked right there and I'm sure she just lived in eager anticipation for my little four-year-old self <laughs> to hop up at four o'clock in the morning and come in the kitchen and help her and the one thing that she made was one of my favorite recipes of all times a buttermilk pie mm. and so she made a, a buttermilk custard that uh, I use in a lot of things now and so this is the exact recipe that I learned by memory starting at four years old and uh, I just I love bringing it where, wherever I can and uh, I love bringing it here to South Dakota uh, like I said she used to make a pie we're going to use the same custard the same recipe and make a bread pudding oh fun so what we we can use in the bread pudding the nice thing about bread pudding is we can use all the leftover bread heels uh, just like stuffing it's okay. it's uh, it's extra things uh, these were some a couple hamburger buns and hot dog buns that were were hanging around and uh, we just kind of cut them up these are still a little soft they can be dry uh, whatever you like to use and now uh, we'll just make the custard um, and I do have a little cheat sheet over here just so I don't mess up uh, Grandma Flossie's uh, um, <laughs> uh, situation here. She, she's watching, I'm sure she is, I, I can feel her. Um, and so what we're gonna do, we'll start out with a couple eggs. The fresher the egg, the better. Uh, we'll use a couple egg yolks to kind of help with the thickening. And so we'll just uh, separate those guys with a little bit of and finesse. So you said the egg yolk thickens? Yeah, this, this, will, this will help thicken the custard. I wanna whip those up good. And I like whipping them up good. I'd like to tell you that there's a real reason for whipping them up good. The only real reason why I haven't is because it's what grandma did. <laughs> wow, and that's, there that's must be something to me. it. <laughs> must be something to it. It's generation after generation after generation. So we whip that up. We're gonna put just a little bit of uh, almond extract in it. About a half a teaspoon. Our teaspoon. A little bit is good, a lot's better. A cup and a half, a cup and a third. Uh, just typical granulated sugar. And again, I wanna whip that in there. That egg, he's gonna hold on to that sugar. Mm -hmm. Kinda help disperse it a little bit. Now, like I said, we are going to use a little bit of citrus. Back to the citrus. Back to the citrus. So I wanna use the zest of one full lemon. The trick with the zest is getting just the colored part. You don't want to bite into the, the white meat in there. There's a little oh, bit of bitterness okay. in that. So we're just gonna lightly go over the top of it and pull, oh, just so much so much flavor and uh, essential oils in, a, in citrus zest. This is where you can pull a lot of flavor out. So that's good. And we want just a little bit of lemon juice in it also. Seeds and all, but we're just gonna put just a little dash. Okay. All right, we're gonna put the buttermilk in there. Again, about a cup and a half. This is a little bit of a cheat, and Grandma taught me how to cheat a little bit on this, so <laughs> we're gonna put just a little bit of flour okay. in there, just about a tablespoon or so. And this will also help hold everything together and set it up just fine. To really add to it, Grandma used to use butter, and so this is where I separate just a little bit. I, what I have here is coconut oil. Oh, uh, okay. I get the solid, unrefined coconut oil, and I just kind of warm it up enough just to melt it. It melts it about uh, 75 to 80 degrees. And you can just smell the difference there. Now I'm kind of adding a little bit of a that holiday nut flavor to it. get a good mix 
and always recheck my ingredients, make sure that I didn't miss anything. A little pinch of salt works out just fine in there. So a little pinch is a pinch. And we have everything else. So now I have the custard. And so a little bit at a time here, we're just gonna add this bread. We're just gonna mix that in and let it soak up that custard. How now, this, soggy should they get from it? I wanted to get kind of squishy. See, now bread pudding is such a thing of uh, personal taste. Mm. Uh, some people like it a little dry to where it's kind of chunky, and some people like it, you know, all the way down to the mush. Mm -hmm. I love it any way it comes out, so I'm kind of <laughs> lucky that way that I'm just not that particular. But I want to let it kind of soak it soak itself into where I don't really have that much liquid left on the on the bottom of the bowl mm -hmm. and kind of give it a little bit of a squeeze and what I, I used here was probably about two hamburger buns and two hot dog buns okay. so <laughs> it's uh like you said you can just use the ends of lots of different uh the, pieces the, the and... heels of your bread loaf uh made biscuits this morning and uh had a few left over, biscuits work well, muffins, muffins. Uh, cinnamon wow. rolls, add a little bit of extra to it. Mm -hmm. And there we have it. It's kind of, it's, it's soaked itself all up. Right. So we'll let that kind of hang tight for just a second. Got a little casserole dish here, a little piece of butter in there. We're gonna just kind of oil the outside of that dish so it doesn't stick. Now we'll add our bread and the custard. Now I'm gonna take a trip over to the uh, oven and we'll drop this in. And this takes probably about 30 minutes, 35 minutes at 350. Okay. Okay, so we have the bread pudding in the oven. While it's doing its little thing there, we're gonna make a topping for it. Now you can put caramel on it, you can put uh, chocolate syrup on it, you can just put cream on it, whatever you'd like. Um, a little bit of flash in the pan, um, and it's something very, very easy to make, and it adds a little bit of elegance and that holiday flair to thing is a bananas foster. Now it's, you know, bananas foster is something that high-end restaurants sell a lot of times. Mm -hmm. uh, they do it over ice cream or, or what have you, but over bread pudding, it's, oh, it'd be just perfect. So we're just gonna make a really simple one, very easy to do. Uh, all we need is bananas, a little fresh butter, uh, brown sugar and honey, uh, something a little, flash the pan here a little bit, a little <laughs> bit of alcohol, bourbon works great, love bourbon. Uh, and just a little bit of cream to finish it to make it kind of a little bit of a caramely sauce. So um, we're gonna let this pan heat up really hot. That's kind of the, uh, the trick to all this stuff is a uh, heat and do it fast, otherwise the bananas will break down. I like to kind of leave them oh, all okay. in there. So we'll just chop up these bananas real quick into nice bite-sized pieces. And a couple bananas, three bananas, four bananas, depends how many people you have hanging around. We're gonna do three bananas here real quick. We'll get a little butter in the, in the pan. And we want enough butter for them to, to float around in, but uh, uh, not so much that it... Kind of tricky because we want our, like I said, we want the heat is the, the main thing. We need to cook this really fast when it uh, when it goes, but we don't want the, the butter turning funny colors or catching on fire or anything. Yet. <laughs> Yet, right. <laughs> so we're gonna get these bananas nice and hot in the pan. Turn it all the way up on high. And what we're gonna look for here is just a little bit of a wisp of the smoke to start uh, coming up off there. A little bit of the brown color starting to appear on the side as the, the sugars and the bananas start to caramelize a little bit. Now what I have here is probably about a quarter cup and three bananas, about a quarter cup of brown sugar. We're gonna get that in so it starts breaking down. Uh, a little bit more of the sunrise honey, kind of add a little bit of deep richness to the, to the caramel sauce. And with a lot of things here that come from South Dakota, especially the honey, if a little bit is good, a lot's better. So I'm gonna put <laughs> a couple tablespoons of the, the honey in there. Get it going. And 
and then I'll re reach around behind me and grab a spoon to break up the uh, break up the sugar a little faster. We're starting to get to our critical mass temperature. And you see now, as all the, the sugar starts to melt and caramelize with the honey and the that looks beautiful. And bananas, now we're getting a nice caramel sauce made there, butter and brown sugar. Who can ask for more? Exactly. A little bit of banana. And now we don't have quite the, the heat it's gonna take, but I'm gonna pour a little bit of the liqueur in there. And good old cream, just a little bit there. And we got us a nice Bananas Foster caramel sauce. And that's it, just as simple wow. and as fast and easy as that. And we have topping for our bread pudding. I wish with TV that you could smell it through the video because it smells so good right now. Okay, so we have the dessert in the oven. We've mm -hmm. got the banana fosters made. The steak is, or the, the tenderloin is, is resting and getting ready to come on over. So we're just gonna finish it all up. The, the butternut squash is ready. We just pulled it out of the oven. And how we tell that that's ready is it's nice and, oh, wow, and look at soft that. all the way around. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna take and pull the seeds out of there now. Just like that, they come out nice and easy. You don't have to scrape or fight with it. Mm -hmm. And then the meat just scoops right up out of oh, there. Oh, look at that. That's easy. You know, you can take a lot of time in peeling that squash and getting all the seeds out and then roasting it. Then you don't have to go through all this, but this, you know, as long as we keep it all in the bowl, <laughs> all kind of, uh, it, it all, very, very easy and also, we're using the whole squash and developing flavors off of this, off the seeds. So now we have just the squash. Okay. So we'll add. We made the we made the brown butter. It had yes. the uh, the honey and the, the thyme mm -hmm. and the sage in there. We'll make sure that that all kind of gets mixed back up in there a little bit. And we made a lot of it but we don't necessarily need all of that. We'll just put a little bit in there. All those flavors have been sitting in that, uh, that nice warm butter and uh, marrying and coming together. Mm -hmm. And then what I did here, just plain cream. Okay. It's a, it's a heavy cream and I just heated it up to a boil. It's called scalding. We get a little bit of a, a film on top of that and we don't need very much of it. A little bit of it on there and use my handy dandy hand masher. Now, like I said, I wanna add my little vegetables, my little peppers to it before I cook it, but while it's still hot, so it has a chance to draw out those flavors. Now we'll add our jalapenos and red peppers to it and give it a stir. And now we have mashed butternut squash with peppers. Looks nice beautiful. bright orange, mm -hmm. lots of color to it, lots of texture to it. What we're gonna do here for a little bit of a, uh, for the vegetable element of our, our dish, we'll make a, a sauteed collard greens. Now again, oh. uh, collard greens, very, very Southern traditional, but there again, it grows amazing in South Dakota. Hmm. So I have, uh, I had to request it. I had to ask the farmers to grow it for me. You know, my southern roots kind of coming out a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, the collards, what are collards? It's kind of like a, a weed, but it's a very, very thick, heavy, earthy flavored green. Interesting. Uh, lots and lots of minerals in there, lots of vitamin C, a lot of vitamin A. It's very, very nutritious. So it's, it makes for a great color, it's great texture. It does take a little bit longer to cook, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's also, it's, it has a, doesn't have that bitter flavor that a lot of mm, other greens mm -hmm. have. Uh, mustard greens, kale, you know, very, very, very strong flavor. Colors right. is a little bit more on the mild side. So we'll get a little uh, butter, of course. Uh, feel free to use olive oil. I'm just gonna pour those guys in there and we'll give it a stir every now and then while okay. we're getting everything else together and they'll be done about the time that we uh, turn on the stove again and uh, get everything else plated. All right, so 
Next is the tenderloin. We're gonna pull that out. Take a look at that. We'll slice it, see how it, see how we did. Yay. Now we just put it in the, uh, the oven, shut the oven off after about 10 minutes. And we're gonna have a nice medium. Oh wow, look at that. And we'll just kind of cut some nice slices out of that. <laughs> see now it's not losing any of its little juices or anything. No. And that's because of searing it and then also letting it sit. And letting it rest is the big thing. If you, you ever notice if you, you pull a steak right off uh, off the grill or mm -hmm. uh, take out uh, you know a, a pork chop or something, you set it on your plate and start cutting up and you get a big puddle of juice. Yes. Uh, by letting it just rest a little bit at room temperature uh, takes care of that. It, yeah. it absorbs the absorbs the uh, uh, juices back. Which helps the with the flavor and moisture as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yep. Get something kind of stir this up. We got a nice sizzle going here. And these will turn a really nice bright green and uh, get just a little bit limp when we have it right where we want it. Um, the big thing is that I don't like overcooking my foods a lot. Uh, you know, collard greens traditionally gets cooked down to, to, to really soft. Um, you know, it does take a little while to cook them to where, where you, can, you can actually eat them, but uh, um, they, they do, uh, you know, as soon as, as soon as they're green and a little bit soft, then, then they're ready to roll. Right. Now we're gonna put just a, a little bit of salt and a little squeeze of lemon. And we're gonna start out with our cranberry glaze. Oh, wonderful. We're gonna put a little bit of this right on the bottom of the plate and kind of just give it a little bit of a little bit of a smear. And then we'll set our tenderloin on there. Nice little four ounce serving. A little of the mashed squash. And our greens are ready. And there we go. Now we'll take a little maple syrup. Add to that. Wow. A little bit of pecan to add the crunch. A little sprig of rosemary over the top. That's amazing. Easy holiday meal. Easy holiday meal, but local so products. So beautiful. Local Another products. Another feature is, is the local products, and then we'll we'll have the dessert out in just a second. Wow, it's beautiful. All right, the best part of any meal is right. Last dessert. but not least. Last but not least, <laughs> it's it's dessert time, mm -hmm. and so we pulled our. Uh, Bread pudding out of the oven. It's, it's, oh, wow. it's kind of a little crusty on top, and it's very hot. So I'm just gonna take a scoop of that while it's nice and warm. Right off the top there. And we made our bananas foster. With a little bit of good, a lot's better. So we're gonna give it plenty <laughs> of the bananas foster. And of course, with everything, we've got to add a little bit of whipped cream to it, just like that. And there we have it. The only thing that's left to do is eat it. Is eat it. Well, that's the best part. Yes, <laughs> obviously. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, you know, that's all I got. I guess if I had one thing to, you know, just to kind of talk about in, in passing to close things off is, is that, you know, the, the local aspect and knowing the story of your food. At Monument Health, uh, I've got a great team of, of cooks. It's taken me uh, quite a while to put them together. They do a fantastic job down there. They're all excited about food. They're young men and women. Uh, most of them are, are fairly early in their, their culinary career, a couple a little further along the way. Um, I, I've got some great people that have uh, really embraced the food as medicine and knowing the story of your food. And you can just rest assured there that when uh, we send up food, it is local centric. Uh, we try and include it on just about everything, especially during the summer. Uh, very plant forward with our protein kind of pulled back just a little bit. And with the, uh, the whole idea of 
if it looks good, if it smells good, the patient will be more likely to eat it. And I know we've got great doctors and we've got great nurses and they care so much about their people, but all that caring and all the great technology and all the great medicine in the world can't out perform what a good meal will do, mm -hmm. what good healthy eating will do for you. Right. So it's, it's very important to respect the food aspect of health and, and everything that goes with it. Right, and the social aspect. And the social aspect. That's, Cooking that's together, nice. spending time together. And, and, and eating together and celebrating and eating together. life by, by food. Exactly. It's fantastic. Exactly. And there we have it, this beautiful Christmas meal. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you to someone's in the kitchen for letting us take over their kitchen. We hope you all have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.